Um, all right. Well, let's uh, let's get this kicked off. It is uh, 5 p.m. on the west coast of Canada right now, and I'm um, excited to be saying that we'll be welcoming Phil Seamark to the stage uh, shortly here. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm going to go through and uh, and clear through our sort of normal uh, stuff that we do here. Um, we're into our welcome and overview right now. We've got our what's new in Power BI coming up, and then our feature presentation with Phil will be starting in approximately 20 minutes or so. Um, first off, I want to say a big thanks to the sponsors that make all of this happen. Uh, Skillwave, as many of you know, is my training platform where we teach you how to use Excel and Power BI properly to do amazing things. Uh, that is a division of ExcelGuru.ca, which is why you see the ExcelGuru logo on the slide there. And also Monkey Tools, which is my software that uh, Joseph and I were just talking about. Um, I've been shipping uh, some new releases to, uh, to this as well. And um, if you haven't checked this out, you should definitely do so. Uh, if you're not aware of Monkey Tools, you should actually check the recording for the last meetup because that's what the meetup was about, was presenting on Monkey Tools. Uh, our next meetups that we have coming up, um, we have our Excel track. Uh, we've got Celia Alves is coming back to join us again. She's going to be talking about dynamic array functions, a must have and what uh, must know in Excel. Uh, I was chatting with her uh, earlier today about some other topics, and it sounds like she's got some really cool stuff coming up. So I'm very much looking forward to seeing that. And the registrations are open for that now. And our Power BI track, uh, right now we haven't announced our speaker yet, but stay tuned for that. There will be something coming up um, on February 16th. Uh, as mentioned, we do have all of our recordings of every one of our meetups. They're hosted on the SkillWave YouTube channel. The short link to that is, uh, as you can see on screen, of course, all these slide decks are posted in Meetup already, so you can always grab those things right from there and get to access of all of the links. And I believe in the PDF, they're all hot clickable and everything else, which is great. Um, now, I haven't actually posted any new Monkey Shorts videos so far this year. Uh, I took uh, December off, and I need to uh, to sort of get back on uh, in a thing here. I've been trying to play catch up a little bit. Uh, but our last uh, three episodes here, um, each of these, of course, being three minutes or less of technical content, we had a few different Power Query techniques. You can check the entire Monkey Shorts playlist at the link uh, that you've seen there. And um, a lot of, uh, ouch. <laughs> Ouch, I'm looking at my chat. Slacker, really? <laughs> like, holy cow. All right, I see how this is going to be tonight. The abuse. Uh, anyhow, yes, um, I have been slacking. No more monkey shorts yet. So uh, it's a good time to review the old ones. Uh, if you are interested in coming to speak at VanPug, maybe you'd like to speak about Power BI, maybe you'd like to speak about Excel, or maybe you'd like to speak about all the awesome things that you do in your free time, uh, we would love to have you as well. So please uh, don't hesitate to, uh, to click on the link for that one as well, and uh, we will get Get you on our stage, um, Joseph. Before I go and throw you uh, the um, the thing here, I do want to just quickly uh, throw out one quick note um, related to the presentation that we had last time. Um, so, as mentioned, I was uh, introduced a new feature in the last meetup for Monkey Tools, which was Biblio Monkey. Uh, I'd mentioned that I wasn't really super happy with the tagging, and I've still got a lot of ways to go in here. But what you'll see is that I actually do have a um, my Biblio Monkey showing up here with a little DAX pattern. Uh, no judgment on this, by the way, Phil, if you're watching. Uh, but one of the things that I've done to this now is um, I actually have instituted some proper tagging on these things. So if you go and you right click something, let's say that I want to put in a new value here and I want to say uh, enter uh, number, whoops, uh, number of months uh, to subtract. Um, when I go and put this in, it now gives a better value of a tag. So you'll notice that I actually get to put in my own prompts. That's new. Uh, we actually get the ability to reuse those tags as well in here as well. So you can actually have the same value going into in two different places. And if I wanted to go and say, maybe put in a uh, measure name in this place here, I can go and add a new prompt here for uh, enter measure. And when I now go and save this, so I'll just hit an update and then go right click and copy it. You'll now notice it asks me, what's the number of months to subtract? One, what's the measure? I'm going to go with sales dollars. I'm going to try and spell that right, even though I'm not going to use it. And now what you'll notice is that if I go and uh, paste this into a cell, there we go. It's actually replaced these values right in there. So there's still a lot of things that uh, that I want to do with this one, but that is an update. Um, we now support up to nine tags of each type. Uh, so nine text, nine values, and, and things like that um along the way here so uh if you are interested in checking that out that is in the newest version of monkey tools uh you'll just want to uh to click and, uh, doing the ads. 
uh, hang on, um, just make a, uh, you know, do a download and, and whatnot, and uh, you'll get the new version there. So uh, that is what I wanted to just make sure that everybody knew about. So at this point in time, Joseph, I'm going to uh, exit stage uh, left here and let you take over for the what's new in Power BI for whatever months we're covering. Sounds good. Thank you, Ken. Uh, let me just grab the screen uh, and off we go. Uh, yeah, so welcome everybody to the first meetup group for the Vancouver Power BI user group in 2023 for the Power BI track. Um, just before we get started, we'll just reintroduce myself for those of you um, who have been here before or introduce myself for those of you who are new. Uh, my name is Joseph Yates. Uh, and I've been presenting the What's New in Power BI at this user group for the last probably two, maybe more than that, two, uh, definitely two years now. Um, I've also presented a few times at the user group as the feature presentation. Um, last year, I took the dreaded January slot uh, with Python integration in Power BI. <laughs> uh, and here on my website at Feathers Analytics, uh, we have the last few sessions as well. So thank you, Phil, for taking the January slot this year. Uh, but I'm sure that I'll have a presentation in 2023 at some point as well. Uh, as I said, my website is feathersanalytics.com, where I write about um, Power BI, have some of my sessions there, uh, but some other tools as well, um, where I blog about uh, particularly R and Python uh, and how we can integrate some of those languages and the power of more data science type functionality into business intelligence solutions. Uh, so as we were, Ken and I were chatting earlier, um, the last What's New presentation that I did was in November, uh, but I actually did the What Was New in Power BI for October of 2022. Uh, so what's nice for this first session is I get to cover two months worth of features, November 2022, as well as December 2022. Uh, there's no January there's no January release uh, for new features of Power BI. I believe February is the first feature release for 2023. Uh, so next month we'll we'll have some new 2023 features to share. Uh, but with that, I'm going to jump in and I'll just go over a few of my favorite new features from both November and December of 2022. Uh, so as always, I'm I'm not able to get through all of the new features um, from the monthly releases, particularly when I'm doing two months worth in 15 minutes. Uh, so if you do want to learn more about any of the features that I do cover, or if you want to see um, a list of all of the new features in its entirety and you want to explore a little bit, uh, I would definitely recommend checking out the uh, Power BI blog. Uh, and this is where we get a feature summary for, for every month of some of the new features that come out. Uh, and one of the, the most eye-catching ones potentially uh, in November was announcing a new Power BI color accent. Uh, and Power BI has updated its accent color from uh, what was yellow to teal. Uh, so if I head into Power BI here, already at the bottom, it's a little bit hard to see, but we can see some of the teal highlighting underneath the current page uh, and the add a new report page button. Uh, but if I go to the get started section, it's definitely more apparent here. What was previously a black and yellow window uh, with some of the get started features and links that we can click and navigate to, we now have a nice teal green screen here. So looks remi may remind us of Excel and the other track in, in, the, in the user group. Uh, but this change was made to make it uh, a little bit more accessible uh, and easier to read as well. Uh, so if I just head back into the blog, my second favorite feature from November was this update to small multiples. And we now have the ability to unshare and unsynchronize axes for small multiple charts. Uh, so to see what small multiples are and to see what that change means, let's head back into Power BI. Uh, and I'm going to be looking at this column chart in the bottom left hand corner here. Uh, and within this visualizations pane on the right hand side, we have a field from our data model on the x-axis, the y-axis, and the legend as well. But if I go to a different dimension in our data model, we can also drag a field onto the small multiples area. And what that does is it creates a unique visual for each of those categories that we have within this field. So where we had one column chart, we now have four column charts because this client type field has four different categories. Uh, and what, what may jump out when we use this field as an example 
is that the bars are really, really small and we actually can't really see them for definitely for young adult in the youth categories down here. Uh, but even for golden and regular, they, they look very squashed and it's really difficult to read. Uh, and usually this is or sometimes this is OK. And um, particularly we want to have a fixed axis if we want to compare a, total values or actual values across these different segments and categories. But sometimes rather than just the raw overall number, we might be a lot more interested in comparing the, the relative trends. Uh, and so what we can do now is with from within the visualizations pane, if I go to the format tab under uh, the Y axis, we can toggle on and off this shared Y axis option now. And if I toggle shared Y axis off, the scale to fit option now becomes available for me to toggle on. And now those bars appear um, more easy to read within each of the segments because the Y axis has changed. Previously, it ranged from zero to $2 billion, but now we see for the different categories, those ranges have changed on the Y axis. We have zero to 1 billion now for this one, zero to 10 million for young adult, and zero to 5 million for youth. So we can quickly see at a glance now that just within those individual segments, this deposit category uh, is the highest for, for all of these segments, uh, maybe except for regular, and loans is pretty big for regular, uh, and the second highest for young adult as well. So just a quick and easy way that we can update our small multiples, and that gives, gives us some flexibility that we can use the small multiples in a few more use cases as well. Uh, so back to the blog. My uh, another feature that I really liked from this month was the ability to create dynamic slicers using field parameters. Uh, so to see what that means, let's head back into Power BI. I'll go back to the second tab. Uh, and field parameters was a feature that I demoed last year. I'm not quite sure I remember the month. Um, but essentially what it lets us to do is that with one single visual, I can have multiple fields from our data model in a slicer, and this one visual can allow us to have lots of different views of our data. So I have two slicers that control this visual. One is an axis parameter, and we can see the slicer right now is, has segment name selected, and I have segment name on my x-axis, and we see segment one, two, three, four. But when I change that to a different option from our slicer, like product category, now product categories on our axis or client type is on our axis. And rather than having to do either some fancy DAX measures or update our data model in some way, um, or even create multiple visuals on our report page or multiple report pages, we can now save some real estate in our report and have a slicer and these field parameters be able to have multiple fields within the same visual. So I have an axis parameter, but I also have a measure parameter as well. So if I want to look at our axis by account of clients measure or a mean balance measure or a total balance measure, I can also add DAX measures to field parameters as well. So now we have lots of different views of our data just using these two slicers. Uh, but what these dynamic slicers, which is the new feature from the November release, what that allows us to do is if we take this axis parameter, and I'm going to copy it, uh, let's right click copy and copy visual. And then we can paste it just down below. Let's add that here. Let's unclick that. So in our original one, we've selected client type. And right now we're only seeing one option in this axis parameter because this slicer is filtering the other slicer down below. But what I can do if I select this new axis parameter slicer, from the drop down menu in the fields well on the visualizations pane, I can select show values of selected field. And now when I select client type, we can see on our visual the values of regular, golden, young adult and youth. And we see these in this slicer as well. So if I just want to look at golden or regular and young adult, or maybe I want to look at all of them, we now have the ability to filter the visual one step further. And what's nice about this slicer and the reason it's a dynamic slicer is when I click a different field from our field parameter like product category, this slicer updates with all of the possible values for this product category field or segment name. 
So in this example, it might not make too much of a difference because we have only a few um, possible values for our segment, our product category, or our client type. But this is really helpful if we have a chart like this and we only want to compare a few values and there's lots and lots of possible values. Like instead of four segments, if there were 10 or 20 segments, we want to narrow that down with a slicer or we want to give our users um, the option to do that. Now we have a dynamic way that we only need to add one slicer. It's impacted by this um, axis parameter slicer, and then we can go and we can further filter down our data. Uh, so I thought this is really cool. I can think of lots of use cases for this. And again, it's just a great way to save some real estate on our report canvas and give our users lots of flexibility of exactly how they want to visualize the data. Uh, back to the blog, and actually going to go back to the top of the page. Um, the the final uh, my final favorite feature from November is the new optimize ribbon, and I can't actually see that on the list of things, so it must be a little bit further down. Let's just search the page. Optimize. Here we go. Optimize ribbon. Uh, and what's nice about this. Um, is that it gives us a little bit more options and again that flexibility for when we're authoring reports and creating reports in Power BI in the desktop application. Uh, so back in Power BI, what this looks like up here on the ribbon, we now have this optimized tab and we have the ability to pause visuals, refresh visuals, and we also have some optimization presets as well. And the performance analyzer now appears in this um, tab on the ribbon. Uh, so, so what this what this means, pausing visuals and refreshing visuals, the functionality from what I've seen it is very similar um, to similar functionality that we get in pivot tables in Excel, where we can pause visuals, we can make changes and update lots of different values in our filter pane, um, or, or just changes as we're authoring the report. And rather than see those changes reflected in real time, that may be um, that may slow down our report development process because we're waiting for all of those changes and for the visuals to update. We can pause those updates, make a lot of changes in bulk, and then just run those updates all in one. And that can just lead to a more satisfying experience when we're not having to wait for a lot of little changes, um, a lot of little changes to occur as we're going through in the flow of developing. Um, so, so this was a really cool feature. I haven't had much of a chance to really dig into it, um, particularly these optimization presets just yet, particularly this customize option to adjust report settings on our own is particularly intriguing to me. Um, but this is definitely one that caught my eye and, and one that if we are developing our own Power BI reports, uh, I would um, definitely check out and read a little bit more on in the monthly blog. Uh, so with that, I'm going to exit November. And I'm just quickly going to highlight a few of my favorite uh, features from the December release. The main one here is slicer type formatting moving to the format pane. Uh, so back in Power BI, we see these three slicers that we've just gone through in our quick demo. Uh, and previously, if we wanted to change these slicers or, or update their appearance and make them a different type of slicer, I would hit the drop down from the actual um, visual header in this space too. But when we do that now, we see that we get this uh, warning message or, or this message that says this setting has moved to change the slicer style, select format, slicer settings, options, and style. So what's nice is because it's a formatting option really for this slicer visual, it now appears when we go to the format tab uh, within this visualizations pane under slicer settings, we have the ability not only to for our selection that was there before, but this options and style that we can display this slicer as um, a tile type slicer. Again, this looks more similar to what we might see in Excel um, or a drop down menu if we want to hide all of the options and just have a drop down menu or what we saw originally, which was a vertical list. Uh, so that was my that was my first um, favorite feature from December of 2022. And my second favorite feature, and this really couldn't have worked out any better with the feature presentation tonight, uh, is a whole uh, slew of new DAX functions and functionality that can make it easier to do comparison calculations. Uh, and that was in the modeling section of this uh, blog. So this is probably a perfect time, and you can tell I've been doing this for two years because this is a seamless transition to the feature presentation. 
I'm uh, going to hand it back to Ken and hand it back to Phil. Uh, and this is, in fact, the topic for the feature presentation today, exploring new DAX functions in Power BI. Uh, so with that, those are my favorite features from the last two months worth of uh, feature releases for Power BI. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your time. And yeah, I'm going to hand it back to back to Ken and we'll start the feature presentation. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Joseph. I appreciate that. Hey, just a quick note. There is a, a question in the chat for you. Maybe if you want to uh, to interface cool. with uh, with Mark on that, that'd be great. So, um, yeah. Thanks once again, Joseph. Appreciate uh, appreciate your work on these things. Um, it is always awesome to uh, to have you here uh, talking about what's new in Power BI. So I don't have to. Um, <laughs> so now, <laughs> I uh, I am super super happy to be welcoming Philip Seamark to our show here. Uh, it's only been like what a month and a half since uh, since we were actually last hanging out together. Which which is really cool. Uh, for those of you who don't know, um, Phil actually wrote me in to do the uh, user group meeting for the um, Wellington user group, which we did live from a pub in Auckland. And Phil, I feel like we should be having a conga line of people going behind you, kind of like we had for mine, but well, you got the beer mug. It's kind of empty though. Um, but I, I don't have that same atmosphere that we had. So I apologize for that. We could probably get a track, but it might distract from things, I guess. So anyway, I'm going to shut up and let you start talking about new DAX functions, because I think that's probably what people are really here for anyway. Cool. Thanks, Ken. Uh, I assume you can hear me okay? I can, can hear you absolutely okay? just fine. Nice. Yep. Well, hello, everyone, to wherever you are and whenever you are. You know, nice to see lots of familiar names in the chat window. Happy New Year and all that. Uh, you know, once again, thanks Ken, to Ken for inviting me. You know, as he mentioned, he kindly presented at my New Zealand-based user group late last year, and I'm more than happy to reciprocate. So I'm going to share my screen and I am going to be talking about um, one of my favorite subjects and that is DAX functions and in particular some some brand new DAX functions that um, appeared in uh, late last year. Um, so let me just share my screen and hopefully you can you, you stop seeing me and you now see a um, an introduction slide. So usually when I mention the word DAX people go running because a lot of people find DAX quite um, dry, quite challenging. Um, so I'm not going to be doing anything too heavy. This is this is going to be gentle. This is going to be intro to DAX window functions, uh, and I'll explain what a window function is, um, you know, more into the um, session. So uh, yeah, quick introduction. My name is Phil Seamark. I work for Microsoft on the Power BI team. Um, I work on a sub team called the Power BI Cat team, and one of our main uh, roles or one of the main um, things that we do on the CAT team is we work with very large enterprise customers, making sure that they are getting the best out of Power BI. Um, so we, we get to enjoy or get to encounter some often quite challenging and tricky situations. Uh, and so we learn a lot uh, and it's um, user groups like here, which is uh, our chance to share. But I'm probably not going to be doing too much sharing of things I've learned in my role of CAT here because these are very new functions. Okay, so just a quick bit of housekeeping agenda. We're going to, um, nothing too complicated. We'll start with a little bit about um, what DAX window functions are, you know, why we've got these new functions. Uh, we'll have a brief look at syntax, showing you how to go and get syntax, um, the, the details. And then I've got some demos. We'll, we'll build some really basic, simple things in using Power BI Desktop, um, just hopefully to give you a bit of a feel for when you might use these. And importantly, perhaps when you might not use them, um, because There'll be plenty of situations where um, maybe um, uh, they're not necessarily the most appropriate uh, function to use. Um, yeah, we'll wrap up with a bit of summary. I'll post some, ho hopefully, uh, I'll, I'll make sure I share some useful links and I'll set aside some time for questions at the end. Now, I do like banter, I do like chat. So, Ken, if you do have a question, feel free to um, chime in, mostly so I know that I'm still online and I haven't been talking to a, um, a, a laptop for the last 20 minutes, but. Um, we can do uh, that, Phil. That's all good. <laughs> awesome. Okay. So, all right. Now, there were some other DEX functions that were also released at the same time. I'm, I'm only going to be focusing on what I call the DEX window functions. Um, these are those functions. Now, there are three primary functions offset, index, and window. And I'm going to show share some um, examples of what they do. Um, but also we're going to touch on a couple of couple of helper functions that can only be used when you are using one of these three primary windows functions. Um, but why? Okay, so 
when when Power BI first started, um, a, a lot of the audience that decided to start playing around with Power BI came from an Excel world. And Excel is fantastic. We all love Excel, probably no one more so than um, Ken. Um, but there are a lot of things that work the same in Power BI as in Excel, but there's also a bunch of things that just bear no resemblance. And um, one of the first things that trip people up when they're coming from Excel is the whole, how do I do a formula? Um, particularly something easy in Excel, such as, uh, I'll bring up some Excel data and, and I'll give you a bit of an example. So hopefully you can see my screen here. Now, let's just focus on um, uh, the, the, the simple data here. If I want to do a period comparison in Excel, as you probably know, I can just write a simple formula such as, I want this cell to equal the cell above it. Um, I'm sure you've done this plenty of times. And of course, I can drag that down and um, the, the same gets applied. And we have this nice, very easy offset. Now, when I jump over into Power BI Desktop, one of the first visuals that people like to play with when they start importing data and messing around is, of course, things like a matrix or a table visual where data is organized um, visually, much like you see here on the desktop. But then how do I do a period comparison? That's where um, it's not so obvious. Now, one of the fantastic things about Excel, or one of the big differences about Excel versus Power BI, is Excel is very coordinate based. You know, we use this R1C1 type no notation where I can make a reference to a specific cell. And the data is going to stay in that cell um, uh, until I move it. So if I'm doing perhaps um, uh, like in Power BI, daily refreshes might completely wipe out my data set and give me, you know, brand new data. So it's very difficult in DAX and um, uh, the, the the database that Power BI uses in Alice's services to actually use the same coordinate based system that um, Excel uses. But it, this is fantastic. This is easy to visually digest, very easy to understand. Um, and of course, the other thing is when you are working in Excel, generally one cell um, only has a single value, a scalar value. I know there are more advanced, you know, these array types. We'll just, we won't go there for now. But generally, you're only ever dealing with um, formulas over a single value in a single cell. And I can create running totals. I can create, you know, some quite interesting range things. And, um, you know, that's all the wonderful things that we, um, we love in um, Excel. So the DAX window functions are part of a much bigger project. Um, this is going to be something that takes us a couple of years to actually fully roll out. But it's a stepping stone um, that's going to enable uh, users to have more of an Excel-like experience. So, um, you know, I, I, I get some data, I want to put it in Power BI, and on the visual, I just want to have, add a column and perhaps have that column being a period comparison or a running total or something like that. Now, that feature that you want to look out for is called Visual Calcs. Uh, you Rowan, who's the feature PM, um, I think he shared a very early glimpse of, the, of this. At, at a session at a conference um, in Europe uh, latish last year. But just if you keep your eye on that. But for Visual Calcs to work, there's a whole bunch of building blocks that need to be put in place for it to all come together down the track. And one of the very early building blocks are these DAX functions. Um, but there's nothing to stop us using them now. They're there um, and we can start playing with them. And potentially, if you are using, if you are doing the, the the classic style of BI calculations, and the three most common that I normally see uh, encounter are some form of period comparison, like getting a, a this month versus last month, or this you know today versus a similar day last year, working out a delta and doing a ratio potentially, and then just repeating that over sales and quantity and units and and whatever your your measure columns are. Um, uh, so the three most common uh, types of calculations are uh, period comparison, running total, and generally like a, a parent-to-child ratio. Um, <clears throat> now, DAX is more than capable of doing this, but DAX has its own style and own language, which, you know, gets, I'll mention this again, if you're coming from Excel, like you've used Excel a lot and you don't really know anything about DAX, it can be quite strange and daunting when you first start there. Um, you know, hopefully you do get there, um, but... Um, these window functions are going to hopefully make the provide the ability to do this almost cell type um, uh, uh, function building. Now, the eventual visual calcs uh, won't be typing in lots of you know DAX functions and syntax. There will be you know lots of helper type um, uh, uh, wizards and things so that you hopefully don't have to write too much DAX. So. 
Okay, so what have we got? We've got offset, index, and order by. All right, so what's the first place you should probably go to when you're thinking about writing a DAX function if you have to? Now, I there are plenty of websites, but probably your starting point should be the Microsoft Reference Guide for, um, for DAX. And the shortcut URL to that is aka.ms slash DAX. And if I go over here and type in a uh, in a fresh browser, aka.ms slash DAX. And if you don't remember anything at all from this session, um, the one thing you should remember is just this link here. And that'll take you to the Microsoft Reference Guide for DAX. And very quickly on the, on the first page that you arrive on um, is this what's new and new DAX functions. All of the other DAX functions in here, I've lost count how many there are. There's, a, there's over a couple of hundred. Um, and they're all categorized into the the, the type of um, function that it might be. There's some time intelligence functions down here, which we'll, we'll have a bit of a look at later so we can compare how window functions um, compare with the DAX, existing DAX time intelligence functions. So let's click on here and we can see here are some recent or new DAX functions that have been added to the um, our engine. And we're going to be looking at these here. As I said, the primary ones are index, offset, and window. And then there are two additional helper functions that can only be used inside one of these um, functions. So let's click in here uh, into one of these offset. We'll start with offset because um, I'll explain perhaps what the difference is these. Now, straight away, this might look a bit daunting. There's this, if you're not used to writing functions and dealing with parameters, it's like, oh, there's quite a lot going on here. But trust me, you don't have to provide a parameter. And you can you can um, uh, write this using fairly simple notation, and I'll I'll show you some examples of that. Um, but when you do want to double check, okay, what what is if I want to do something a bit crazy, can I do it? Come back to here, or read the uh, documentation, which we continually update, for example. Um, and I do have in my reference section later on a bunch of other uh, sites that I recommend that also um, will will try and help you um, understand when it does come time to use the function, how do I actually um, enter the calculation? Uh, correctly. Now I talked about um, now what offset does. I'm going to jump back to here. Okay. So courtesy of um, Jeffrey Wang's blog. Now Jeffrey Wang works for Microsoft. He's often described as the father of DAX. He's been around. Uh, he's been working on uh, uh, Power BI and anal analysis services for probably longer than anyone. Um, and he has written some very good blogs, which I've added into the reference note, much more detail that probably I'm going to cover on today. And I've grabbed a couple of um, uh, images from his blog where he goes through and starts talking about, you know, what are these some of these um, signatures mean? And here's a picture that um, I will save this PBIX and, and I'll share it, is um, here's a picture to describing what some of those um, parameters are actually referencing. Now, the first function we're going to talk about is offset. So what does offset actually do? Coming back to Excel, offset is very similar to the calculation I, I performed here. What it does is it recognizes or attempts to recognize the cell or data point that we're perhaps running on, and then um, uh, we'll go up one or down one or up two or down through, de depending on whether you put a positive number or a negative number. So it allows you to sort of jump around back and forth based on uh, your relative position. because um, And that can be quite, that is the, the go-to function when you're doing a period comparison, when you want to compare the value that I currently have in the the, the, the cell I'm, I'm talking about versus perhaps the one above or, or, or one below, or even the one side to side. I'm going to show you some interesting things about offset that you can't do with traditional time intelligence functions. The index function um, is kind of, um, it's the... Um, it's the complementary function to offset, where, where offset is relative to the cell that it's trying to generate a value for. Index looks at the column or the row, and it starts with a one in, one base index, and it allows you to jump to a cell. So if you, for example, so I want to get in my calculation the value that is index one, it's generally the one that's at the top um, or the bottom, depending on how you decide to order the um, the, the, the code. But you don't have to go to one. You could go to the second or the third or the fourth, um, uh, and, and and that could be useful for 
um, some scenarios, but probably typically you you might be doing a um, comparison with the first or the last um, using these functions. But the index is absolute, so where offset is relative to your position, index is is absolute. And, I, and I've got demos to show um, that working. Finally, the the window function allows you to pick a range of um, uh, values. So where index and offset will always reference just one other uh, data point, window allows you to do multiple data points. They do need to be contiguous because one of the two of the parameters that you provide is a from and a to. Now you can say, um, you know, I want to just um, create a, uh, a, a perform a calculation over the last seven days relative to myself and you would use the um, the window function there um, so window is a more advanced function than offset and index because it has a couple of extra parameters where you can specify to and from but you can also specify uh, whether you are talking about an absolute um, reference or a relative reference and I have some examples showing uh, the window function being used with both of those and you can also mix and match them so a running total is, allows you to do a combination of a from and to where one of them can be an absolute uh, reference and the other one can be two hopefully this will make more sense when we um, are talking if I jump back to the uh, presentation here what this is describing is let's say we have a, a visual with um, data displayed like this and ordered like this, if you were to use the, and we're on this current row in the center, if you write a function that talks about, um, I want to get the value at index one, well, it will go and grab the, the, the value here. Or if you wanna grab the value at index two, you can grab the value from here. Interestingly, um, the uh, developers and engineers implemented this with the ability to provide a negative number. And what the negative number does is the opposite. It kind of jumps to the end. So if I'm talking about a value um, here, ordered in this particular way, if I specify that I want to get retrieve the value uh, that's at index minus two, you're actually going to the end and coming back a couple. So this is quite a powerful um, technique that is much harder to do today. It's possible, but it's it's you you're going to be writing a lot more DAX and you're going to be having some very inefficient uh, query plans, no doubt. So index is the um, is the absolute. Offset is always a reference to yourself. So you can see here on the current row that offset minus one means the cell above. Offset minus two means the cell or the row that are, are two above, depending on how you're ordering. And likewise, one, two, three, four, five, etc., um, go this way. And there are the the other um, functions that we have uh, provide the ability to do sort of more advanced um, things. So as I mentioned, these are really good for. Um, uh, we're going to do some demos that show the you know how to do a period comparison, running to totals, and um, the uh, partition by which allows you to reset. This is something that um, again might make more sense um, once I actually start um, uh, demoing this. Now I'm going to use the Power BI desktop for demoing rather than DAX Studio. Um, and I'm going to use the matrix visual because I think this visually shows the effect of each function better. And the model I'm going to work with is a really simple uh, model. This is in uh, direct query. Whoop. I might delete this. This was just me rehearsing, delete from model. We'll come back to this. Um, okay. So my, my model is AdventureWorks. I'm only working with um, a, a very small number of tables because that's all I need to, to demonstrate this. Um, it's indirect query, which shows that uh, all of these functions work in direct query. And, and I've, I'll, I'll give you, um, if we have time, um, a, good def, a good explanation as to why um, uh, these uh, window functions are uh, quite helpful in direct query mode. So we have a fact table in the center of a couple of simple DIM tables, one on time and um, one on product. So I have a base visual at the top here that we're going to use to reference because I just want to eyeball, when I start creating visuals down here, I want to go back to see, um, am I getting uh, the, the the right value, for example? And the first, the first example or the first demo I want to use is just that period comparison using offset to go and find the value in the row above or the cell above. Um, so, for example, to find the previous year's sales. Now, this can be done with existing uh, measures, um, but I don't think the syntax is too daunting. While the um, uh, reference guide potentially may have been, let's have a look. So I'm going to create a new measure. 
And I am going to call this measure offset measure one. Now remember, offset does a um, uh, allows you to provide a relative reference. So we're going to we're going to run the calculate function. This is this is not a new function. This has been around for a long time. And what we're going to do is we want to perform a a calculator. We're going to call a measure called total sales. This is exactly the same measure that we're using up in the um, uh, the visual above. Now we're going to call the offset measure. Now I only need to pass two values to this at the most basic level. I'm going to pass a, a negative one. So this is me saying, let's um, go and find the value from the row above. But I'm going to specify, I'm going to use the, the helper function called order by. And I, I'm saying I want to order by the calendar year column in the date table. So if I click OK, which commits the uh, measure to the model, and once that's done, I should be able to drag this measure down to uh, here. OK, it's expecting one there. And let's let's check to see whether we've whether this has um, worked correctly. Um, I might just set the decimals to zero. And we have commas. Oh, so if we eyeball, the values are all identical. You can see the, the gaps are where the gaps are. Every single cell we look at um, matches perfectly. The only difference is that the top row up here um, is, is representing these numbers as belonging to 2017, uh, whereas here our function is um, showing that these numbers actually belong to uh, 2018. So if we wanted to write a calculation to compare 2018 data, so this 10 million, and we wanted to make a delta and over the, the, the value from last year, we can go and subtract the, um, uh, the value that this particular um, calculation provides and then create a difference and do a divide if you want to or you know more complicated stuff as you need. So that was pretty easy. Let's go and edit this. Um, hopefully you can actually see this okay. Let's put in a minus two. And it should hopefully um, give us exactly the same values, but they're going to be offset by a, um, a two now instead of three. And in fact, what we're doing is we're dropping years off. Now, if I put in a positive value um, like this, okay, we just did that commit possibly. I need to hit this. We're going to go the other way. Um, so here is where offset can say for any given cell, such as this one here, go away and figure out what would be the values, you know, if I were using Excel and that one happened to be two rows above me or two rows um, uh, below me. Now, this is the this is quite common stuff that we do work with dates, et cetera. But one of the neat things about the offset function and, and all of them is they're not bound to the date or date time uh, dimension. You can actually do this uh, over any column in your model. So what I'm going to do is edit my measure and say, I don't want to, um, in my order by function, uh, go back and forward along the calendar year line. What I want to do is uh, uh, go back and forward along the product um, uh, dimension, so the color, because I'm using uh, product color in this visual. And we've committed this. So what's happened here is that the value in our base measure of three point something million that's associated with black in 2017 has now been shifted um, back one to, to blank. Now blank is a genuine um, uh, 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 position. Uh, blue, 7,000, that has now been shifted up. Now it's doing, the, you, you do have to be careful with this and there probably aren't too many scenarios where you would want to do this on a non-date time dimension, but hey, there might be scenarios where you have got um, uh, product categories or, or product numbers that are A, B, C, D, and you do want to compare the value for C with the value of B. And you can provide that column in the offset index and window function with the appropriate reference um, uh, values, and it will it will order the um, uh, column that you've you've specified and go and actually figure out what the the value is if you know that you had um, filtered on that anyway, and then continue to use that in your 
calculation. Um, now here, here, this is something interesting also. Uh, gray down here. Why have we got a gray down here, but we don't have a gray up here? And that's because in our base calculation, sorry, our base visual, uh, we don't have any data for gray in um, in our database. So if I go show items with no data, this column, uh, the color exists, but it has no data. So what's happened is that the value for multi has shifted to the left one, and it's effectively uh, woken up or provided gray with value, which may or may not be what you want to do. Um, so just something to watch out for there um, when you are doing peri comparisons. All right, so now let's have a look at, um, let's change this. We'll, we'll go back to the calendar year and we'll play with the index function. So offset allows you to do um, uh, relative referencing. Index gives you absolute. So what I'm going to do is just put back to calendar year because that's really easy to follow. And we're just going to change this. You can see how easy this is. It has the same parameter function. So now what we're going to do is reference the item that's at index one. Um, and we're going to, we want the index function to consider or order by the calendar year column. And we click OK. And that should be committed. All right, so what's happening here is the values in the first row are just being repeated over and over again. And that's because we've effectively said, I always want to use as a uh, the, 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 that top row to be my starting point. Now, this is probably going to be more useful in the window function, which we'll get to next. But there may be times where you always want to compare to January. And just, you know, if you sort by calendar year and month and you can reference one, then you can you can uh, compare how your month compares with with January if you're organizing grouping and filtering by month, et cetera. And the same rules apply. So we can edit the measure and we can play with the values and say, I don't want to look at the top row. I want to look at the second row. But before I do, actually, we've lost a whole bunch of columns here. Um, we don't have gray, nor do we have NA down here, nor do we have silver and black. And that's because um, when we are referencing the index, we're not, it's, it's not column specific. Um, index one belongs to the value on the header, if that makes sense. So in the case of um, silver and black, where there is no value, it's blank, it's null, it's, it doesn't exist. Um, when we're using a measure over here that just constantly has returns a, a null or a blank, by default, what happens is Power BI visuals will just won't display it. Um, I can probably fix that by saying show where um, show items with no data, and we might get those blank columns. But again, bear that in mind that the behavior is not per column. So index one for NA is not this value here. Uh, index one is always based on the uh, column that you're using in the order by column, um, regardless of whether there's data or not. Now you can wrap this, you can wrap the, um, so the window function with first non-blank and get the first non-blank value, et cetera, to go and perform that type of, um, uh, you know, if you do want to go and retrieve for any given color, what was the value the first time it got sold, accepting that each color might have a different point where it started being sold. Um, and you can, like I said, you can you you can wrap the new window function with that. If we have time, we might do that. So, um, and what have we got here? We've got the we're, we're using index one. Um, so if I change this to be index two, then what we should see is whatever values happen to be in the second row of data are now being repeated over and over and over here. So for whatever reason, my business requirement are that I don't want to compare with the first one. I always want to compare or do something with the data that's in that second row. And silver black is the only one that doesn't have any data. Well, gray either as well. So that's why it's blank over and over again. Um, now, if I put in a negative value, say for example, what minus one will do is it'll go and get the value that happens to be stored at the end of the, um, uh, the the column. Now, in my data, my DIM table has got a row for 2021, but it has no data in it. So if I actually put minus one in, I'll just get blanks everywhere. So what I need to do is go to minus two, because 
I don't have any data in my base table for 2021. I have data um, in my base table for 2020. So if I put in minus two, then any columns here that have data for that, that's what we're going to repeat over and over again in here. Um, but to really play with you, um, let's, let's have a look to see if that worked. Uh, sure enough, 4 million is down here, 3 million, 3.2 million down here, etc. Cetera, et cetera. It's, it's working um, as I expect. But to further play with you, the order by function allows you to specify whether you want to um, uh, flip the order. So negative two ordered by this column descending will now actually be the equivalent of putting in a two um, with the default, which is ascending. So my expectation here is that we should get the 2018 values repeated over and over here. So that, that negative um, value can be quite useful too as well, being able to jump to the first and the last, and um, even when you don't necessarily know how many values might be in that sequence, um, because that might, might, might vary. You know, as soon as 2023 data turns up, it's going to now have additional data. So I, maybe I don't want to go from one to something. Um, okay. Now what I'm going to do is um, jump to the uh, window measure. Hey, Phil, before you do that, I noticed yeah. that uh, um, we've got a hand raised from uh, from Mr. Hopkins. So I'm wondering if you yeah. uh, might want to take a question from the floor. Oh, yeah, give it a, give it a crack. I'm sure it'll be a, um, a tricky one. Oh, just wondering how... Um, how does it get impacted if you're using like a sort by column, like for month? Does that mess things up? Um, I haven't tested that. I haven't actually tried that yet, out yet. So I can't answer that honestly. Um, it's very easy to, to test. If we have time at the end, we can have a bit of a play with that. Um, cool. But, you know, these are quite new. And yeah, I've, yeah. I have been on my summer holiday for four weeks. So I haven't had a chance to play with this. <laughs> Me in too. A, in, a, in a production one. So that's a great question. And maybe at the end, what we can have, a we can try out and uh, see what happens. So, no um, yeah, great no question. Problems. Cheers. All right. So we talked about offset is the function you use when you're trying to reference something relative to you. Index is the one when you're trying to do um, an absolute reference. So the final one is window. Now, window can return a single um, cell, but it can also return many, but they do need to be contiguous. You can't sort of uh, chop and change. So you, what we're going to do is specify a start and a finish. And in fact, I'm going to go to the syntax and uh, click on window. And you can see here we have these additional um, values that we can put in. If you don't put them in, I think it does provide a default, but you're probably going to want to actually control this. Now, the two the types that you can specify here are REL for relative and ABS for um, absolute. Um, and as I said, you can mix and match. But what we're going to do with the first one is um, um, we're going to start simple. So I'm going to paste in this new function. OK, so there's a few more rows of data, uh, uh, so a few more lines of DAX. Where are we going here? OK, we can I got this this time. All right, please ignore rows three through eight. All I'm doing here is rather than calculate a measure like total sales, what I'm do doing here is I'm just building a little bit of a text string that I can display in each cell showing what what would be um, shown uh, based on the window. Um, you know, this this would be the, the text I have highlighted here is what you would swap with your DAX expression like sum of sales, you know, or the more complicated um, session that we've got. So what we really want to focus on are these um, um, these values down here. So what I'm starting with is a value of zero. This is my from. Line 11 represents the range should start from uh, relative to me zero, and it's going to go to relative to me zero. So what this is in effect doing is it's like referencing myself. So if I go, if I commit this measure and use it in my um, uh, visual, it's all it should do is just show me um, just what I am, um, which is the, the year on the axis. Um, and it kind of works like offset. So if I go like this and pop the measure in, 
I've clicked on something here. Let's unclick that. I don't want to cross filter. I'm still cross filtering. Here we go. Here we go. So in every single cell, the value that my new measure is outputting is just the what the window function has um, summarized down to based on the calendar year um, at relative zero from relative zero to relative zero. So let's um, expand on this and maybe let's make it um, uh, from relative zero to three. And relative is like using offset. Um, so whatever cell we happen to be on, like this 2019, should show 2019, 2020, and 21 because it's ordered by calendar year. Um, and zero, oh, uh, three must mean, you know, we potentially might have four values. And you can see in the data behind my um, uh, address window here that in 2017, if I were to substitute my concatenate X with a measure, that measure would calculate over rows that belong to these four years. Um, whereas in the, in the next row down, it would calculate over the four years uh, shown here, 2018, 2019, 2021, et cetera. And I flip that, if I flip that back, back around the other way, so perhaps let's start with zero. And you don't have to start with zero. You could start with one or minus one when you're using relative, um, if, you, if you want to include you or not. And let's just throw in a minus three. Uh, ordered by calendar year. So it's, it's effectively going to return a table of potentially four rows um, to be applied as a filter over your calculation. And it's not returning anything. So I suspect what I need to do is make the from and to um, in the right order. So let's go, let's go with minus three, two zero in this case. So we can't just simply um, expect it to go uh, whatever way um, and here we go. Now the um, the IntelliSense is um, showing red because this is these are still very, very new functions. They, they, they will commit, they will work. So please just ignore IntelliSense um, when it comes to order by, you know, unless you are genuinely making typos. So what have we got? We've swapped it around. So 2021, this cell is looking backwards now. It's actually any calculation that would um, uh, appear in this cell would be um, over the rows that belong to 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 these four here. So now let's change it to um, ABS. So we can go, um, let's go from one absolute. Now zero does now when you're using absolute, you can't use zero. It's always it's a one base index. Um, so if I put in three and ABS, What we should see is just commit. No, not yet. I have a very old laptop. So this is we're now using the absolute reference. So every single cell will perform a calculation using the first three years ordered by here. And I could put in, I could put a two and five and three and, you know, any any number I like. And if you go over, you don't, like, for example, if there only happens to be um, five items or six items potentially to be um, selected for in the, uh, in the array, if you put in a 99, it won't error. It just will give you everything as if there was um, blank value. So that's, um, that's kind of cool. Now with um with this, the window function doesn't necessarily have to be used, you know, with concatenate x or with calculate and, and measure. You can use it with um average. Um, uh, so I'm going to perform another calculation here, getting rid of my concatenate x, and we're going to say I want to retrieve the max value that happens to be in the range from the cell above to the cell below me, uh, ordered by calendar date. Um, and yeah, go and grab the max total sales. This is this max x function has been around for years, and we're saying just go and retrieve and figure out and display um, what would be the the maximum value um, from either above me or the one below. And if I go OK, and you don't have to use max x, you could use min, you could use average, you can you know create some nice smoothing um, type functions using the same. Um, uh, and and let's just check to see if this has worked. I might need to. Fix my formatting, and we can see that black. Um, 
I have got multiple measures here. Wow, I've broken Power BI. There we go. OK. So the highest value in this column here is at 2019. There's 11 mil. So at 2019, that's going to show us 11 mil. That's going to show us 11 mil. That's going to show us 11 mil. So you can see how you can actually start playing with these numbers, uh, playing with the window function to, to very easily create more interesting type um, calculations. And um, I mentioned running total earlier. Let's um, uh, pop that in. And I'm going to go back to my using concatenate x, because if I show the uh, measure total, then you have to do some pretty quick maths to see if I've, I've got it right. Uh, let's throw in, and this is mix and matching, the um, uh, absolute and relative. So what are we saying here? Don't worry about lines um, three through seven. That's just me building my piece of text to show what years would be considered by, or are, are being effectively brought back by the window function. Um, we, we're saying we want to go from uh, position one absolute. Now you can't use position zero. It's one based. So this is the item that's at the very top. Of course, if you use two, it'll be the next one down. And you can use minus one for the opposite way. Um, but the for the two parameter, we're specifying that this is going to be a relative one. So this is going to be fairly dynamic and represent um, perhaps what cell I am. And, and cell zero in this case means myself. Um, and you know we're going to order by calendar year. I'm not going to show you you know changing ascend, ascending and descending. You know I, I think we've covered that. So does this give us a running total? Now there are a whole bunch of Dex time intelligence functions that provide running totals, but only over things like um, a day, um, you know month of year, um, quarter to date. You know these there's, there's there's but you can't perform a running total over. Well, there's no native simple Dex. I'm intelligence function that, that allows you to perform a running total over multiple years. You'd have to go to the filter function and start messing around with filter context, etc. Which for someone coming from Excel, it's like, oh, this is a lot to pick. This is a lot to learn. OK, have we got this right? So 2017, that would calculate over all data that belongs to 2017. That makes sense. 2017 and 18. Yeah, so this is looking pretty good. So if I was to sub substitute my concatenate X with um, my total sales measure, um, the total sales measure would provide me with that very easy running total. Um, and you can you can flip this the other way as well. Um, I, if I put in a negative one value for the uh, f the absolute for the from, um, then it would go from the end and come backwards, which may or may not be useful to you. Maybe you're doing some Pareto type charts or um, other type scenarios as well. But the key thing here is within the window function that to and from uh, those those two and from parameters, you can um, change the um, the type of reference from relative to to absolute. Okay, now I'm going to stick with running total, and calendar year is a bit short um, to show the to demonstrate the next feature. But one of the helper functions that uh, I, I we talked about at the start was a function called partition by. And this allows you to, to do a reset. And a running total is probably the easiest one to, to visually consider. Um, you can probably use it for more, all sorts of things. But um, let's say I want to do a running total by each week. Um, there's no, no DAX time intelligence function built into this. Um, but it's really easy to do with the, with the window function. So I'm going to go to my daily running total page here, where I have a, uh, a chart with one row per day. Um, so Saturday the 2nd, now the, the reason why there might be some gaps here is because perhaps that day didn't have any um, uh, data, but this will appear when I add my measure. <clears throat> and these days, the, the each row is allocated a, um, a week number of year. We're going to partition by this. And what do I mean by that? I want to perform a running total, but I don't want my running total to start on row one and just keep going up and up and up and up and up all the way down to the bottom one. I want it to reset. So every time I hit a boundary, between um, the week number of year, then I want to go back to zero and, and start again. And th this is not that straightforward in the DAX functions we have today. It's definitely possible, but um, I'll show you how easy that is with um, with the win with the window function. And the key is using the partition by. So if I click on measure one, and we're going to overwrite, and we're going to paste this in. Okay. 
so I'm not using my concatenate X trick anymore um, because I think we can see what's going on when I do do this. Um, we're going to calculate total sales, which happens to be the same column as the, the, the middle one here. We're going to use the running total trick. So this is mix and matching absolute and relative again. Um, and we're also going to, um, uh, here, we, we need to provide a table in the order by uh, the, 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 that has not only the column we want to, um, well, the, the, the column that we need to partition by. There's a couple of extra parameters here. One here called keep. Just always use keep for now. There will be another value that you can use down the track. If you want more detail on that, it's explained in the um, the Power BI or the DAX reference guide, but also that um, Jeffrey Wang blog will, will um, explain what that's going to be for. But the really important line that I want to draw your attention to here is partition by. And this is just the instruction to the window function to say, I want you to perform this additional layer of grouping. So every time you step, um, because we're going to order by this, um, you know, so let's have a look to see what this does. And click OK, and we'll drag it in. OK, maybe if I just click it. Oh, here we go. It's, it's, I didn't have my measure selected. This is why I don't build reports. <laughs> uh, here we go. Click. OK, so pay attention here to the week of the year numbers. So where we have a boundary like here, the, the top value, 5,000, is um, uh, committed over here. Uh, just ignore the, 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 the cents, for example. Then the next value looks like it's about 5,000 plus 42. Then the next row doesn't change. We add six, goes up appropriately, and carries on to the end. But now when we hit the boundary between 28 and 29, we start again, and, and so on and so on. And I can put this in a line chart. But um, as I said, we do have native functions that do this on some built-in uh, calendar types, like day... Well, actually, no, you there's no point um, running total on a day, but um, I think month, quarter, and year. You can't do semester. You can't do calendar week, for example. Uh, and you can obviously control the values that go in here to determine whether you know your week should should boundary on between Saturday and Sunday or Sunday or Monday or whatever's the relevant one for your locality. Um, but I think it's pretty – I don't think that's too hard. Um, and you can see how flexible it is. Now, I'm going to extend this to – show how you can use the same um, functionality to do uh, a year and month. So um, have I got this here? Probably, oh yeah, it's there. So I'm going to replace my function. And I will share these um, these uh, functions with Ken after the session and he'll find a way to, to uh, get it to you. So if I pop this in there. So now what we're going to do is same thing, perform a, a total sales our running total trick, but this time we're going to order by um, a multiple column. So we're going to order by date, year, and calendar year. Um, ignore these for now, <laughs> um, but we are going to partition by two columns here. We're going to partition by month and calendar year. Now, this does replicate what uh, month to date does so far. But let's pop that in and just make sure that it um, behaves as we expect. But there are some reasons why perhaps you might want to use this in, in place of um, the, the native function, which I will explain in the next section. So if we come back here, we probably don't want the week number in the visual anymore. And I'll put in a zero here if it lets me. Probably don't need to bring in the month and year because if this is sorted by day, we can see that, um, sure enough, we're starting on 20,000, we're incrementing, we're incrementing, and then as we get to the end of July 2017, uh, and we drop down to the 1st of August, we reset again. So, um, you know, this is again showing how you can use the the uh, partition by with um, the window function to do slightly more complicated things. So I'm sure you'll have a lot of fun with that. I haven't yet found any use cases for it, but that's only because I've been on holiday. These are new functions, and when I do encounter more interesting type scenarios, more advanced um, uh, uses of these, I will put them on my blog site later in the year and you know shout out about them on Twitter, et cetera. 
Okay, how are we going for time? Let's have a look at the, um, let's dive down a little bit into the engine and explain why perhaps you might use the window function instead of that built-in time intelligence function. Um, Bill, before so, you dive into that, um, I sure. noticed that there is a question in the chat from Wynn, uh, and I think it was actually related to the previous example. He was asking why you use the all selected. Um, you don't have to use all selected. You could use auto buy. You could use all. Uh, all selected would give you flexibility that um, if you did have a slicer external of the visual and you're playing with your uh, date ranges over multiple years, for example, it will behave in a particular way. You know, you might want to um, you might want to respect that selection or you might want it to disregard that selection. So it's it's not essential. You could use all. You could use all selected. You could use auto buy. Um, they will all have slightly different um, behavior. Um, Probably for the simplistic examples that you play with, it may not matter too much. The more important thing is that here, for example, when I wanted to, because I didn't have a month and year column in my uh, data set, I had a year column and I had a separate month column, and I was showing how you could use the partition by um, functionality over multiple columns, and I could have added additional ones as well. They don't have to be on the visuals either, because you'll notice I'm not using the calendar year or the month number columns in this visual yet it's still figuring out for the relevant day to behave the correct way so um, um so, so phil do, do the does the window function and offset function these ones do you have to break out the filter context to is that why you have to use something like all or um i do, yes you yeah yeah you do um depending on whether you're using the second or third parameter, so they're optional. I'm not going to dive down into that because I think it's quite a um, uh, it's the next level down, and I recommend you have a look. Now I've sort of introduced this to you because they do mix and match. Because the second parameter, which is optional, you could use all or all, all, all selected. And yes, you're right. It's to deal with filter context. The third parameter is officially order by. But the engine is smart enough to know that if it comes across a parameter in the second or third parameter and you're using the order by function, it goes, aha, I think I know what you're doing. You're using that um, third parameter. So I must, uh, if I jump back to here, uh, okay, I'm going to, uh, sort of yeah, so it. here, so you can provide a table. You can actually provide a summarize function as a table, for example, and, and you know, start doing much more advanced stuff with your windowing and um, et cetera. And then you can either order by the function um, and there are default values of what happens if you don't provide a value in either of these parameters. What it what it um, what it defaults to. But I'm not. Yeah. The, I haven't first, played with these enough to explain that expertly simply enough without. Yeah. The, to the not first time I looked further. at it, it was uh, it was that that's the bit that threw me when I first looked at this. So it was just yes. like, why am I having to do that bit? So, yeah. So yeah. Okay. So just to just to quickly recap, if you happen to provide as the um, uh, the after the first numeric value in order and index, um, a function such as all or any table function, because you can use summarize or um, a bunch of things like that. You know, if you happen to provide a um, a, a a table that knows you're you're suggesting something to be used here, um, and then you know the additional you can also provide an order by function, which right. does need to be the the built in um, one to determine whether you're sorting up and down, etc. Um, but for a lot of your initial ones, hopefully you don't even need it. Um, yeah, as yeah. you saw with mine, I didn't use the all function for my calendar year. So it yeah. sort of took care of it with my order by. So cool. All right. Thanks, man. No worries. I hope I haven't confused um, you further. <laughs> Here, Phil, I also got a question for you. I mean, obviously, this is pretty powerful stuff when you look at it. But, you know, in, in a lot of ways, this very much feels like um, like it very much feels like code in order to be able to get to very precise results, which is fantastic. Yes. But one of the things that DAX has been fantastic with over years is providing a lot of sugar syntax to make that job a heck of a lot easier. Mm -hmm. Do you anticipate that like we'll see later on down the road that we'll actually get like a new DAX function, like running total in or something like that, where you'll actually just be able to put in the column names to say, give me a running total on this measure across these columns. So I don't have to write a massive DAX windowing function in order to make that happen. Um, possibly. I suspect the priority, the, we're going to more bring the um, visual calc feature so that you're not even having to worry about that. And this is going to be uh, layers of UI that means, okay, under the covers, you're building what I'm showing you today, but you're not typing as, as um, you know, it's actually doing it for you. So 
it'll give you a bit of a wizard or a builder or you know some helper things as i said keep your eye out for visual calcs your own demo uh, um showed this at a session next last year and i suspect when the big events happen and in, in, in a few months time you'll see a lot more detail about this but it's a fairly big project um and these three functions as i'm showing you today are the building blocks so yes you can yes you're right it's raw but i think the intention is not necessarily to expect all users whether the beginner intermediate or advanced to have to use you know typing the functions out um, as i'm doing uh, ideally the um, beginner and perhaps intermediate or people that know what's happening can use uh, a friendlier user experience to create under the covers what these are doing but potentially yeah maybe um, i think if we get enough feedback that says I'm using this over and over again. It's the same thing. Can we just, like you say, have a have a, a running a new running total function that really is um, just the cosmetic and, and sitting over the top of these building blocks? Um, so, short answer, cool. I don't know. Long answer, <laughs> rewind. Fair enough. <laughs> Good stuff. Thanks, man. All right. So hopefully you can see my um, my screen. So I've got Dex Studio up, and I've got a calculation where if I run it is running against exactly the same uh, Power BI data set, which is in direct query mode. So this is all running, you know, uh, T-SQL in the background to a local host database on my machine. And what this is doing is in the first two columns, we are grouping, because when we, when we use the summarize columns function, the first uh, bunch of parameters that we provide, if they are column references, that's telling summarize columns that we want to group by these columns. So I'm saying I want to group by calendar year and month number of year. And I think at the bottom, I've got an order by those, so it's nice and easy. In my one, two, three, four, five measure columns, the first measure column is the total sales that make sense for that month and year. That's going to be a base reference. And then what I have is I have four columns that are all providing exactly the same result. If you eyeball and scan across, every single row in the last four columns shows exactly the same value. But I'm, I'm writing them using different um, techniques. Now, why am I showing this to you? Because I want to have a look at the server timings to see which is the more efficient and optimal um, uh, uh, approach to do this. Um, so we could we could use, oh, I, and this number here is the um, the number for the total sales for the month previous. I just you know, haven't formatted them for simplicity. So we could use the previous month time intelligence function. We could use the parallel period and say I want to do you know, negative one in month. And I could use minus two, minus three, et cetera. These will all work. I could use the date add function. There's many different ways I could actually write this, but I wanted to focus on the native time intelligent functions. So if I comment all but the first time intelligence function out, and I've got my server timings on, let's, and I'll actually turn off total sales. So we've got no noise. All we want to look at is what work is Power BI doing or the or analysis services DAX doing to arrive at the, um, previous month value of total sales when using this technique. Now we run this. I probably have a comma in the wrong place. I possibly have a bracket in the wrong place. Oh, I have. I need to comment these two brackets here out uh, because they belong to my last measure. Cool. So the results, let's just assume, well, we know that that's the correct result. Let's focus on server timings. We've got three server timings here. So the, to arrive at this value, the engine needed to make three trips to the database, three trips to the store to go get the ingredients to bake the cake. The first trip was to go and just get a list of every single individual day. Even though we're grouping by calendar year and month, because the calendar column, a calendar table, is connected to my fact table on a date key that represents an individual day, what it has to do as a step one is go and get a list of all the individual days and, and it's going to use that in subsequent steps. The next one is just going to get a, a, a um, it's not doing any calculations, it's just getting a, the unique list of every combination of uh, calendar day, month number of year and calendar year. And this is what's going to help uh, draw the axis effectively. And then finally, what's going to happen is we need to go back and actually run our query against the source data. So, so this is trip three where we are going to perform our sum of the um, sales column. This is all alias stuff, but it's performing a sum. And when we scroll down, you notice that the scroll bar is really, really um, small. And that's because the query that we are sending to the database is just a select statement in adjoining 
a whole bunch of individual little select statements unioned on. And if we focus on what is it doing, is it's grabbing the 22nd of September, the 23rd of September, the 24th of September. This list here was constructed um, as a piece of text based on our first trip to the storage engine. It works, it's, it's correct, but this is a big piece of text and there's going to be a cost, there's going to be a hit to that. Some sources don't like big pieces of text, for example, but it sh I mean, it should work. Now, if I um, uh, uh, comment out the top one and bring in the next time intelligence function, parallel period versus period month, and do the same task, just assume it's going to give us the correct result. We, we, we checked that when we first um, jumped over to DAX Studio. Same deal. We are um, grabbing a list of every single calendar day, not month, not year, every single individual day. We're also getting a grouping of every single unique day, month, and year. And then finally, we're spending a second and a half or 1.2 seconds uh, executing this very long, very, 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 very long, it's probably got five years worth of data. Imagine if we had 20 years worth of data, for example, back to the database, it gets the correct result and it displays it correctly. So three trips to the storage engine and probably not the most optimal way. The last one we're going to have a look at, date add, again, produces the correct result. We're running it, server timings. So what's actually happening with these is analysis services is saying, you know, based on what you've typed here in your formula, I'm going to come up with a bit of a plan. And this plan happens to be the same among all three approaches here because we're going to see the same um, approach. The individual day, group by day, unique columns for the visual, and then a big ma massive long list of um, days unioned on, which um, I know in the early versions of SQL, it probably would have complained bitterly about this. So what does the new window function look like um, in comparison? If we uncomment that. So we're going to calculate total sales, same as what the first three did. I'm just going to offset because offset, remember, is relative. Go back up. I'll get rid of that. Um, and you know, here's that all function. So all calendar year, order by month, number of year, and um, minus one, let's run. So a couple of things I want to draw your attention to. Straight away, we're only doing two trips to the storage engine. The first one is grabbing the unique number of months and calendars. It's not touching the day. It's not needing to go down to that day granularity, and it's only returning. Um, uh, I'd yeah, it actually doesn't show us as a direct query and, and number of rows that got returned. If we looked at the um, uh, query plans, we'd see that. And then the second one, we have a very similar um, uh, query that goes and performs the sum of sales amount. But when we scroll down, it's not perfect. But um, what we're doing is we're we're passing a con sort of a, a, a query expression that dynamically constructs a table. But the finest grain of this table is is at month number and and rather than individual day. So it's a much shorter um, uh, piece of text that we're sending out and hopefully much easier for your data source. You know, data sources are different. But here's an example where, yes, um, the, the the existing time intelligence function, particularly this one, may be easier to write because we only provide it with one parameter. Well, realistically here, we're only providing the offset function with two parameters. OK, we're, we're putting in two values here. Um, but it's not that different. It's not really that much more complicated than the existing native DAX to our functions. Um, and, and why is that? Perhaps that's just simply because the existing TI functions uh, were written some time ago. Maybe they, they did their job. Now we've had the chance to start building these new functions. We can make sure that they are built in a more optimal way, that they create better plans, that they the strategy for going and collecting the data is hopefully uh, more efficient. And this is especially useful um, or important when you're dealing with, say, direct query um, data under load with lots of users. The, the the fewer trips to the storage engine, often the better um, to do that. So, so that's um, pretty much my session. So I just want to double you know, clarify. Window functions, the window DAX functions, are part of a much larger project. So it's a very exciting project. Um, they really are for that, but hey, why not use it today? It's there, so long as you're happy to to to, to write a little bit of code, but hopefully I've, what I've shown you today uh, makes it look not so daunting. And for those of you who are from a very big Excel background, you know, you can start visualizing in your head what the syntax might look like when you start want to start creating more Excel-like 
uh, referencing um, in, in your Power BI visuals. So keep your eye out for those Power BI visuals. I'll share this deck, um, but absolutely keep your eye on the uh, uh, Power BI blog, which you probably, I'm sure you do anyway. I mean, you know, there'll be monthly new as we start filling out the visual calc stuff. The Jeffrey Wang blog, Jeffrey Wang, the father of DAX, he pretty much wrote these functions. So any article he writes is the the go to, and he will dive into a lot more depth and um, go down more t technically deeper than I have today. Um, Chris Webb, uh, the ever tiresome Chris Webb, who pretty much has put out a blog a week for the last two hundred years, uh, he has got some recent articles on these window functions, so they will be absolutely well worth having a look at. Uh, anything by the SQL BI guys is just gold. They they're always high quality. Put a lot of effort into making sure um, the information, the content, how they describe things is uh, very approachable, good for people at any level of of DAX. Um, finally, not necessarily rela related to Windows functions, but if you if you use the AKA.MS PBI guidance, that takes you to a section that the CAT team um, uh, use as a as a place for all sorts of tips, advice on many, many topics, not necessarily even code, center of excellences, um, you know, how to migrate and, you know, there's there's plenty of gold in there. So I always like to include that in my um, uh, references. So with that, we can... Did we lose you, Phil? You have paused on us. Hmm. Um, hopefully, we'll, Phil will be uh, will be back and uh, internet uh, not interrupted. So um, while uh, while we're waiting for Phil to sort of reconnect on this one here, uh, if anybody's got any questions, oh, there you go. I think you're back now. Yeah, I can so see you moving. Excellent. I just had to um, go put some money in the internet meter. <laughs> there you go. Um, <laughs> excellent. I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad that it worked. Um, Having uh, recently been in New Zealand and driving through, I, I know how the Wi-Fi is there. It's uh, it's hit or miss. Uh, you guys have lots of hills and valleys. It's incredible. So, um, Fernando's got a question for you. How will this affect calculation groups, if uh, if any? Well, I mean, it's, they can be used in a calculation group, um, as as I've shown you. So, um, what what you can start doing is in the calculation group, where I was putting in like the the, the section such as. Um, uh, the concatenate x or the the total sales is the first parameter of the calculate function where well, you can use the calculation group um, helper functions like um, selected measure and it'll just work so my expectation is um you know and i would recommend playing is that if you were using calculation groups to reduce your measure sprawl so that you're not writing a, a suite of measures for quantity and, and units and, and sales amount you can just create a calculation group and uh, put the template dax function but use these window functions equally as effect effectively as um, any other DAX function. And it should work in direct query as well, which is a big bonus. There might be an cool. edge case, which I haven't discovered yet, but um, there you go. I personally um, haven't tried it. <laughs> I'm curious. Do you think, uh, after seeing the the, uh, the test results of the uh, built-in DAX time intelligence functions uh, versus what you've actually got from these ones, do you think that the team will end up going and doing some refactoring under the scenes of what the uh, the native functions are to try and actually incre increase the performance, or is that something that's like so not on the radar? It's not even funny. I don't know. I haven't specifically looked at that backlog item with that group of engineers who owns the feature, but it sounds like a fantastic idea. I'll you know. Um, I have a regular catch up with those teams, so I will ask. I, I perhaps won't be able to easily share the answer here, but um, no, I'm, I'm sure enough, I already think about it. I don't know. think I've ever raised a question with them and they haven't already got a deck or a bunch of explanations. But, yeah, you know, <laughs> we'll fully pull that through and here are the pros, here are the cons. And um, uh, so I wouldn't be so, too surprised. Um, oh, once we know... Don't. The, Fernando's you know, this, telling them the Ken functions. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm just looking at this going like 249 milliseconds versus like 1.6 milliseconds or, you know, 1.6 seconds. There's obviously room for optimization there if yep. they wanted to do it. And I mean, you'd think that if they've got control of that, they know exactly what box is going there. It'd be a, a, a great way to see some perf gains on things for the people that are using the, the sugar syntax already. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. And this is only over 60,000 rows, just on a little local yeah, host okay. database. So sure, my, my my process is not that fast, but imagine you're doing this over, um, you know, billions of rows. Um, then no, you're really going to start, um, hopefully, you know, trying to make every tuning, um, take advantage of any tuning opportunity that you've got there. So, Yeah, absolutely. I see Wynn showed, uh, showed up again here, so I'm guessing that means he's got a question for you as well. But he's on mute. mute. 
<laughs> Sorry, no, I'm just showing my face at the end. Oh, okay. um, one thing I will say though about these these functions is that you do have to be careful with is um, you are specifying inside each of those three functions, index, window, and offset, uh, generally some columns that you want to sort by. Now, often that means you need to pair the measure up with the visual. Um, uh, because things like the native time intelligence functions, you know, month to date will just work with whatever you kind of select. Um, so just also be aware of that, that um, sometimes what it might end up meaning is that you're building a measure that is custom customized for the visual, especially if you're going to do some more advanced things, um, which depending on the report could be perfectly fine. But if you're really trying to create a self-service environment where people can drag and drop measures that you create in all sorts of wacky, weird ways, then they, maybe they might not necessarily get the, the values that they expect from the older um, functions as well. So just bear that in mind. Question on that really as well then is, there's no way of stopping a user applying a sort by on a visual, like in terms of they've got a matrix visual, they can click on the heading and it'll sort the matrix in different orders. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so so I'm jumping back to my screen, which I think I'm still sorting. So, so I know what you're talking about. So if I go to the first column in this top visual, if I just sort yeah. it the other way, uh, or actually down in the bottom, I don't, I'm not, I, I don't quite remember what the last one was. Um, just just, do, do you get an unexpected result? No, because the, the sorting gets defined within the function itself. So if the user then plays with the ordering here, the um, numbers should just appear. I can't actually remember what the function Oh, this is this um, um, but let, the, the one based on year to let's date. Say, oh. Let's say it was black, blue, grey in a in a row. Yeah. And your order by is that same sort of order in your function. But yeah. then the user does a sort by, you know, just clicks on the heading to sort it the other way. The the measure will still give them the original result, even though the Each order cell is will being... Have the, the, it'll, be, it'll have the correct value because the sorting... Um, for the to, to retrieve the values as controlled within the, the function itself. Yeah, so it'll give the same to... result, but I don't know whether that would be the expected result. Right, okay. So I, I think the, I mean, this is a, the this is a running total. There. Yeah, so once this commits, we'll have a running total over calendar years. Um, month number of year. No, that's not the one I want. Uh, I need to just scroll up a little bit more, sorry. Because uh, I'm kind of curious myself, and I'll, I'll use one of the um, Concatenate X uh, versions so that we can just look at the year. And um, uh, if I get all the brackets, okay. And I'll paste that. Oh. Excuse me. I'm glad Dax is hard for other people too. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't the bit that's supposed to be hard. Um, this is more a um, got my I've got my standing desk up high and I'm like playing with my mouse. And... Okay, so this is a running total showing just building that string of what um, uh, years would would be used. You know, we can substitute with with. Um... Okay, so. Okay, I've got the little spinny. And minimize this. I'm sure, Do Teams not, is maxing out my CPU at the moment. Does the fact that you haven't got order by in there going to impact this? No, the um, order by is default. So it's sort of ordering by calendar year. Uh, okay. And that is explained in the documentation. And the order by of, um, um, direction is default to ascending. Right. So if I was to put in another parameter here, the fourth parameter, and type in order by dim date calendar year, ascending, it shouldn't change anything. It's sort of defaulting to that. Right. But I could yep. put it in if I wanted to switch it. So here we go. Finally got there. So 2018 is a running total of 27 and 2018. 2019 is a running total of everything older than that, including itself. So if we sort by calendar year, we should hopefully get 2017 at the bottom. I'm pretty sure I clicked that. Yep, we have clicked that. There we go. So it has actually, well, this is what I think would be the expected values and the the visual level sorting doesn't impact on the value that's showing. It is, in fact, correct. So if I came up with some crazy new sorting um, okay. mechanism, then you know, it should hopefully, you know, the calculation should still 
run over the the appropriate rows. Yeah. So it's um, 34 minutes past the hour. Um, I think I'll probably... Any 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 more questions? Uh, I don't think so. I think we're uh, I think we're clear on these ones. So um, I'm gonna I think I'm gonna wrap it up now and, and just say um, Phil, thanks so much for coming and uh, and doing this. Um, I know that uh, you haven't had a lot of time to play around with these things. I mean they're they're relatively new and as you say you've been on your uh, your summer vacation, but uh, it's a fantastic presentation. Very much appreciate it. And um, yeah, if I'm uh, I'm kind of looking forward to see where these things go. This is this is interesting, and definitely if uh, the performance is there, yeah, I can see some good reasons to start playing around with this mm -hmm. and start refactoring some of our own logic. So, yeah, very cool stuff. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. No worries. See you, see you everyone. Yeah, Happy absolutely. Um, all right. So uh, for everyone uh, here, just to let you know, we'll get the recording posted up. Uh, hopefully within the next 24 to 48 hours, uh, we'll be hosted on the, uh, the SkillWave uh, YouTube channel. And uh, don't forget that our RSVPs are open for our next meetup with uh, Celia that's coming up in a couple of weeks. So hopefully we will see you there. And until then, um, have a great one.